Um, well, welcome, folks. I'm Heidi Joy Twethaway. I'm Senior Marketing Manager here at the OpenStack Foundation, and I'm very happy to introduce you to Jonathan Bryce, our Executive Director of the Foundation, and then also um, we have many members. Oops, looks like we have some interference. Oh, thank you for muting yourself. Um, and we also have many members of the foundation here, as well as um, community members, including Shamile Tahir, who spearheads the Roadmap Project um, with the Product Work Group, and will give us some extra um, uh, support and, and color commentary on what we have to expect with the Newton release. Um, we're a couple weeks out still from the Newton release. Um, that'll be on October 6th. Uh, but between now and then, we like to give the members of the marketing community a sneak preview of what we're working on, key themes and messages to give you an opportunity to blend that in to your press releases and your customer communications. So um, to that end, we'll include this presentation as well as uh, opportunity to download slides in a follow-up to the marketing list. Um, we want to give you as many assets as possible to help you um, build your own custom customer communications for your company. All right, that said, um, I'm gonna scoot over to sharing a screen with you, and I wanna share the Newton release. Here we go. And there we go. Okay, are we seeing that all right? Yeah. Yep. So coming through. All right. Go, Jonathan. Go. Um, I, I guess the first thing I, I would say just is um, I covered the agenda with you, and so um, Jonathan, take it away, please. Okay. Thanks, Heidi Joy. It's good to uh, to have everybody join us again for this little uh, pre-release ritual <laughs> that we do, where we start to uh, to preview the themes that uh, that we've seen emerge in the latest release cycle. Um, as you're probably all aware, the, uh, the the next OpenStack release is codenamed Newton, and uh, this is uh, I think the 14th release of OpenStack. Um, so it's uh, it's you know um, we're pretty far along in in the process now, and as as we go through some of the themes and and some of the features, I think what you're going to continue to see is is really the uh, the continued maturity and, uh, and stability of the software that has really led to um, significant production usage in, in the last year, year and a half, a big uptick in that. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we started talking about um, kind of towards the end of, of 2015 as, as a key message was, <clears throat> was OpenStack as a, uh, as a platform for integrating multiple um, types of technology and, uh, and we see that that's um, becoming even more capable and more versatile uh, with the latest releases. If, if we look at Newton, um, it has support across uh, bare metal virtual machines and uh, containers for managing a lot of uh, a lot of different kinds of workloads in a lot of different industries, and that uh, that versatility is something that that over and over again we hear how valuable that is to organizations. You know the 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 landscape inside of um, most data centers out there is one that is very mixed. It has a lot of different technologies, has um, different kinds of hardware, different kinds of software, different applications, and so um, you know islands of of uh, technologies, islands for managing these different resources, don't help um, companies have a really strong and uh, and uh, versatile strategy. But uh, OpenStack, you know, has has the ability to to really manage a lot of different components. Um, we can go ahead and move to the next slide. With this uh, release specifically, some of the uh, the themes that um, that we uh, break down the progress in uh, that we think were the kind of the key highlights um, were scalability, resiliency, and user experience. And if you have um, followed along over the last couple of releases, you've probably noticed that some of these themes have uh, have continued from release to release, like scalability. Uh, but one that I think is is uh, was really strongly represented in in Newton is the resiliency component. 
Um, and that is something that's, that's evidenced in uh, a variety of updates across multiple projects. We'll talk about some of those details in a second. But uh, resiliency is really about high availability, about um, you know, the, the availability not just of the OpenStack infrastructure, but also the ability to run highly available workloads on top of the OpenStack infrastructure. And so that includes um, the ability to do no downtime upgrades, the ability to do live migration, um, the ability to do active-active configurations for various services. Uh, so progress was made in, uh, in, in a lot of the projects in different areas around that. And I think that's uh, a, another one of those things that, that we see leading to this trend of increased production usage. Um, user experience is, uh, is one that we identified in Mitaka as, as a key theme, and we see that continued in Newton as well. And that is both the user experience for operators who are um, operating the OpenStack cloud, as well as for the end users who are consuming the OpenStack cloud to deploy applications or to, to program against the OpenStack APIs. Um, so this is improvements to, to documentation, to out-of-the-box defaults and configuration, um, to uh, things like get me a network, um, the ability to, to easily have a, a kind of a default network topology that comes with virtual machines. Um, a lot of things that, uh, that, that again, span the projects and, and really improve the, uh, the user experience. Um, we can uh, go ahead and move to the next one. And at this point, I want to uh, also uh, invite um, Shamail to, uh, to, to chime in here. Um, the, the product work group, for those of you that, uh, that aren't familiar with it, um, has, uh, has been uh, putting together a lot of really, really in-depth information across the projects. They spend a lot of time talking to the PTLs and to core developers and, uh, and aggregating information about the work that's been done on each release and kind of the, um, the overall planning and, and uh, you know, roadmap, so to speak, for, for where the projects uh, are planning to go over the next couple of releases. And, and they do a lot, of, a lot of research and put together some, some really detailed documents. Um, we, in, you know, in, these, uh, in this material, we try to boil a lot of that up into something that's more high level and bite sized. But uh, uh, I think that we have the link somewhere for, for those documents. Um, but if, yeah. you, if you really want to dive deep, then, uh, then I, I definitely encourage you to go through, the, um, through their full roadmap document. I think the, the, the one uh, roadmap PDF is, is like 48 pages, but it's, uh, it's got a lot of good info in there. So I want to invite Shamel to go ahead and talk about some of the specific updates um, across these key release themes. And uh, and you know to highlight um, what, whatever he wants to bring out from the work of the product working group as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Yeah. So um, you know the key themes of scalability, resiliency, and user experience are very prominent in, in Newton. And you know some of the things that we can talk about specifically to highlight that are you know significant enhancements to ironic uh, integration with Nova and being able to you know do multi tenant networking. Um, for bare metal nodes um, is, is a huge one, as well as the ability now to support uh, multiple compute services from Nova running ironic uh, or provisioning ironic bare metal servers. And so what this means is this now allows better scale for ironic because you're not depending on a single service, as well as it provides some additional resiliency as well because you can actually run multi if, if one instance of the compute service goes down, other ser uh, compute service instances could uh, fulfill the request still. Um, Along those same lines, we've also seen some groundwork be laid by the Cinder team to get to active, active volume services in the near future. So Newton, uh, we're not quite there, but a lot of the legwork required to get to active, active in certain uh, components of Cinder has, has occurred, as well as uh, Jonathan mentioned, you know, uh, no downtime upgrades. And, and a big one, this release is Neutron's ability to be able to do uh, no uh, downtime API service upgrades. So uh, just a ton of work, again, scalability and resiliency, and then user experience, of course, um, is, is all also being addressed constantly. Actually, that's been a key for most of the OpenStack releases that, that we've seen, and Newton is no exception here. And some of the things that are really interesting around user experience in Newton are the ability, for example, uh, for Cinder service to be able to provide some messages that kind of give 
back information on why a request failed, for example. So just uh, better hinting for end users, as well as Nova has now moved uh, the configuration options for the compute service into code, meaning that there's less policy files to manage unless you want to modify one of the default settings. So again, just a ton of work being done across the teams and the roadmap document as we talked about is 49 slides and covers about 25 projects um, in depth across Newton and even some future directional insights after Newton as well. Jonathan, uh, do you wanna add something or move on to the next slide? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that, uh, that again, you know, there's, uh, as, uh, as we've mentioned, the, the roadmap deck has, has a lot of detail, a lot more detail than we can go into here, but um, I think that, that you hit the, uh, the highlights. Obviously, I think the, the Neutron work and, uh, and the Nova work um, and, and, you know, I mean, the other thing that with, with Nova is Sales V2, which is a feature that we've talked about for the last couple of releases, um, is, uh, is moving along and I think they're expecting a, a big milestone in the next release in Okata. So, um, so this is uh, this is one of the things that's nice about the roadmap and and uh, and kind of the way that that, that uh, this team has been tracking these things is you're you're able to see also the progress on some of these bigger work efforts that do take more than a six month release cycle um, and it's cool to see some of those landing here in in Newton and then also being able to see that we're getting close to some of these big updates for Okada as well. Uh, but yeah, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so uh, the other thing that we like to do when we um, do these updates is also look at the kind of the community progress overall in um, in uh, the release cycle, and uh, we've had the opportunity to to go to uh, a number of events in Asia and Europe um, and be able to talk with some really interesting users, and uh, it's it's always great to hear what is driving their usage of OpenStack and and you know, these are, are um, increasingly, these are not technology companies that we're seeing deploy OpenStack. I think that's a really important um, uh, shift that, that, again, has happened as the software has matured, where uh, companies like JFE Steel in Japan, uh, they're one of the largest steel manufacturers in the world. And this is a, a very mainstream um, uh, business that, uh, that uses OpenStack uh, to, to power their IT, and you know why would they do that? Well, they did that because they were able to improve their performance pretty dramatically, and at the same time, cut their overall IT costs. So better performance for lower cost, that's a really compelling business case, and, uh, and that's why we see um, you know, companies that are not just really technology-driven starting to use OpenStack as well. Um, in China, uh, the State Grid Corporation of China, they spoke in Austin, uh, we were also able to to hear them in Beijing at an event there and get even more details about what they're doing. They're the seventh largest company in the world. They have a million and a half employees, and uh, they do power generation and transmission for, um, I think, 27 provinces in China. They've rolled OpenStack out in nine regions and continue to expand it. And it's uh, it's, it's just, a, again, you know, a really interesting use case to see um, to see them uh, using this. Uh, next slide. It's infrastructure for infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, it's infrastructure for, for physical world infrastructure. Um, th this is, uh, these, these two companies are, are more on the, uh, the technology side. Snapdeal is uh, India's uh, online marketplace, similar to um, eBay or Mercado Libre. Uh, we're really getting all which of the run on yeah, which also run on OpenStack. We're getting all of the online marketplaces, <laughs> um, but they uh, they launched an OpenStack deployment recently, and they went uh, they went pretty big out of the gate with a uh, hundred thousand cores. And um, again, you know they they are uh, are a technology company, um, but you know what's driving them is not just because OpenStack is 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 new technology or whatever. It's really business drivers, performance, and cost. And uh, we have a, um, a, a great case study on SuperUser about them that goes into some detail about what drove their decisions, how they did their deployment, and what it looks like. 
uh, and it's a it's a really interesting one to um, to, to look at. Um, Betfair is uh, it's actually Patty Power Betfair. I think they they merged just recently. They are uh, the largest um, betting site and, and gaming exchange. They um, do more uh, exchange transactions than the New York Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange combined. So it's a it, it's a, a really large um, exchange that they run, and uh, it's something that uh, that uh, is very very much in, in kind of a software defined world where they have uh, they have a real need to move quickly to roll features out and uh, and they have implemented a continuous deployment workflow on top of OpenStack um, in production. Uh, this, they have over 200 applications, as it says here, uh, and they run this in uh, in two redundant data centers um, where they are operating a, a private OpenStack cloud. Um, and another really really interesting use case, and got to spend some time with uh, with their team in the UK uh, last week or the week before last, uh, and talked to them about about how they built it all out. Uh, and it, you know, it's just it's it's so. Um, Encouraging and interesting to be able to to talk to these companies and see how uh, you know this technology that that we've worked on and that the community develops is really enabling their businesses to do things that uh, that they would really struggle to do um, with, uh, with other technology. And as I said, you know, more case studies at superuser.openstack.org. Um, as we look at, at kind of the uh, uh, the community side. Um, there, there were a couple of things that, uh, that were interesting um, developments in the Newton cycle. Uh, one that we're going to highlight at the summit in Barcelona is, uh, is uh, about the security team, um, which has put together some really, uh, some really good material on security and OpenStack, both how to, uh, the resources that document how to um, implement a secure OpenStack cloud, as well as how we manage security in the software development process and uh, an ongoing um, on an ongoing basis with the uh, with the deployers, the vulnerability management team, um, code testing, and and all of the the efforts around that. Uh, but because of that, uh, we were recently awarded the Core Infrastructure Initiative badge, which is a uh, um, an effort that uh, that has a uh, Come about in the last couple of years to really <laughs> encourage open source communities to be um, security minded. Uh, you know, this is this was something that came out of kind of the uh, the aftermath of the Heartbleed incident, where um, you know we see this these core infrastructure systems that that so many businesses and research organizations and government organizations depend on, that sometimes are not uh, getting the the resources that they uh, they could really use. On uh, on security specifically, um, and this is something that uh, that you know we've had a pretty good focus on in OpenStack, and it's really increased recently. Uh, and so the Core Infrastructure Initiative recognized that. I think we're the largest open source project to receive that yet. So that's a a, a cool recognition of what uh, what our security teams have been doing. And then um, the other update is around the Interop Working Group, which was uh, which is was the the rename for the Def Core Group. Um, Kind of you know just clear over clever. Uh, let's say what it is. <laughs> it's a working group that works on the interop standards. Um, so this is uh, if you see interop working group, that is what we used to refer to as Def Core. Um, there was a uh, a big update to the interop spec in the August board meeting. The latest spec is uh, really expanded. It includes over a hundred new um, tested capabilities. I think it went from about 120 to 225, something like that, uh, and it includes um, a lot more coverage around networking, authentication, um, image management. So some of the uh, the really key components that uh, that have stabilized and uh, um, are you know are now part of the uh, the interop guideline. Um, so that was a, a very big and important update, and it took a lot of a lot of work on the part of the the interop group to, to kind of um, put that uh, put that in place. Next slide. Um, so 
Another area that's that's been interesting to see as we uh, as we've traveled around is the growth in OpenStack public clouds. Uh, there are more than 30 OpenStack public clouds worldwide. Um, I think that uh, that it's in something like 50 cities. Is that right, yeah. Mark? Yeah, I was going to say this is Mark. Um, we're we're actually been been pulling the numbers as they continue to grow uh, all over the world, and so we're actually in uh, 50 cities. So if you think about uh, OpenStack um, in aggregate across all these public cloud providers, not only are you getting lots of choices in terms of who you would potentially work with, but the regional um, options in terms of you know, location for where you might want to have your data or be closer to your users or customers is really pretty impressive. And I think that if you look at the total footprint, it's, uh, it's growing rather rapidly. It's probably one of the, the, the few stories we haven't, we haven't talked as much about. Um, but as we as we head into the the next summit, I think we'll be pulling that data and sharing it more more and more often. Yeah, and uh, and I mentioned already um, that uh, we uh, about the state grid corporation of China, but uh, we, we've also started to see um, a number of production use cases uh, in addition to that one come out from uh, from China. Uh, China, China Union Pay was a really interesting one that we heard about at the, uh, the OpenStack event there. China Union Pay is, I think, the only card provider in China. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty big one, <laughs> pretty important. Uh, and uh, they're using OpenStack in production. Um, Dongfeng Motors is uh, maybe the second largest car manufacturer there. China Telecom, China Mobile, uh, obviously a very large uh, telecom companies uh, with hundreds of millions of, of customers, um, a number of banks, including the Hang Seng Bank and uh, Post Savings Bank of China. Uh, and, and another thing that, uh, that was, really, it was really cool to see when we were in China was how strong the startup community there is. There were, I think, eight startups at the, uh, at the OpenStack event there. Um, and two of them, uh, EasyStack and UnitedStack, are, uh, are actually gold members of the foundation. But, uh, you know, it's, there, there are a number of other companies there who are um, startups that are, are really building businesses and helping to spread OpenStack in China. <clears throat> All right. And uh, so uh, a spotlight on um, you know, some of the, uh, the, the other types of compute. I think people are generally pretty familiar with OpenStack as a way to manage virtual machines. But, uh, you know, increasingly we're seeing um, that, that, you know, <coughs> workloads run on a variety of, of uh, kind of modes of compute, including containers and, uh, and also bare metal. Um, Ironic had a lot of really strong updates in this, uh, in this cycle that, that uh, Shmel touched on earlier. Um, one of the things that's that's interesting to see is that as you look across these, you'll notice that uh, that there's tighter integration between all of these components. So, for instance, um, Magnum has a, has support for doing Kubernetes directly on bare metal now. Magnum is the the, uh, the provisioning engine for uh, for container orchestration tools. Did you say Kubernetes on bare metal? Kubernetes on bare metal. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, and so uh, so Magnum started out with placing um, placing container orchestration systems in uh, into virtual machines uh, through through Nova, but obviously for a lot of uh, a lot of people, um, one of the appeals of containers is improved uh, performance and uh, and being able to run those containers directly on on bare metal. Um, so that that's a, a great update to uh, to see in uh, in Magnum. Um, Magnum itself had uh, had um, some updates in how it's structured and the uh, the tools that are available uh, to manage the different orchestration systems that it supports: Swarm, Kubernetes, and Mesos. And uh, and one of the things that that again ties it all together is the networking support for containers. Um, Courier we talked about in at the Tokyo summit almost a year ago now. Uh, but it, it's made a lot of progress in the last year, and uh, there are releases now for um, for Swarm integration using Lib Network, and then also for Kubernetes uh, integration. And uh, in Newton, there is a kind of a, a a preview or an early release 
of, uh, of, of doing um, what's called nested VMs, but basically uh, the ability to, to uh, expose a network from Neutron up through a virtual machine into a container that's running in the virtual machine. Um, so this is a, it, it's a, it's a really powerful uh, component to have so that you can have individual containers um, on separate networks and, uh, and be able to manage their, their network traffic uh, the way that you would want to for especially any kind of regulated industry, but really just anything that, uh, that's security sensitive. This has been one of the specific things that, uh, that um, has in some ways uh, you know, kind of limited or, or caused people to have some concern about running containers in production is just kind of like the, uh, the network models and the integration with kind of standards for um, enterprise network security. So this is a, a really good update um, in, inside of Courier. And, uh, and I think, again, it just shows the power of having, having one platform that ties all of these together. Because there's, there really isn't another technology out there that is, um, that's approaching all of these needs in, in a holistic way to integrate um, to integrate them together and really take advantage of the strengths of the different kinds of compute, networking, and storage. Um, and no one's doing that like OpenStack is. So um, I think, uh, you know, this is just kind of the wrapping it up. It's, uh, as, as we've mentioned, a lot, of, uh, a lot of good updates that are based off of user needs and, and user experience, uh, improving the, the ability to manage and scale it, uh, as well as run um, production workloads on resilient infrastructure. And uh, that concept of the integration engine that ties all of these technologies um, and really supports the versatility that, that people need in their, uh, in their environments. Um, while uh, you know, just making sure that um, that it's all integrated together, and uh, and and really kind of gives you uh, the the platform that you need for your workloads today, as well as a place to take advantage of emerging technologies. I think that that's uh, that is it for the the Newton update. And Heidi Joy, uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Shamile, for your very excellent and detailed information here. Um, but we know that there's a lot more to dig into. And one of the things I really like to learn about is um, what were the user needs or the problems that, um, that companies were facing that we're trying to solve in each release? And so we wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of um, how to learn more about those. Um, if you want to learn more about individual features or individual projects and what they're doing, we have more than 20 five, maybe seven minute recordings that are one-on-ones -on -ones with the project team leaders about um, what are those user needs or what, what were the hot topics coming out of the last design summit. Um, and this again is a project of the product work group um, doing interviews one-on-one -on -one with these PTLs and then pulling um, PowerPoint slides out of them that just really boil down those short conversations into the, an even shorter um, uh, uh, bulleted list that supplies the roadmaps key information. So we have a YouTube playlist. I put up a short URL for you so you can um, head right over there if you'd like to now kind of be in conversation with those um, PTLs. So we're going to take questions in just a second, but I wanted to share a little bit more about the marketing's um, the marketing release plans for Newton. Um, as we're looking toward um, our release date here very shortly, um, this marketing preview uh, is recorded and then it'll be shared also with the community. We also have a press release in progress, a release website in progress that will live at openstack.org slash software slash Newton. Nothing is up there yet. That'll come out on the 6th of October. And then we also, um, just as we did in the Metaka release and previous releases, have this wonderful video demonstration of core features um, and the key features and enhancements that you're going to see coming out in Newton. And that will be released um, with the press release and the website on October. 6th. But the video demo um, is really essential to be able to see how things work. Um, and then we also take some excerpts and screenshots there um, that you see in, in on the right-hand side of your screen, just kind of a taste. Um, this is what we did for Metaka as well. 
Um, we also wanted to give you an opportunity to dig into the community generated roadmap further. So I've added a couple of um, just slides from that roadmap to get a sense of which projects are covered. Generally, the roadmap team tries to cover every project with greater than 10% adoption based on the last user survey. Um, and then for every project that it does cover, you get a wealth of information, not only for the Newton release, but looking forward three total cycles into Okada and Pike. Um, so you can learn more about not only what's being delivered um, next week, but also um, what will be delivered in future releases. Um, you can look at a 100-foot view that's really um, specific to the project that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You can boil that up to a 1,000-foot view and see what specific project themes that each project is working for, working toward, and then a 10,000-foot view. Um, really big picture on that. Um, I want to pause for a moment. Shamil, do you want to add anything um, about the roadmap since you spearhead it? No, uh, I, I think uh, you summed it up really well, Heidi Joy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so team, uh, you know, actively works on this about twice every release cycle. And, and we really do try to cover as much projects as we can. So the current release does have about 25 projects that it's covering. Awesome. Thank you. So um, now I'm going to take everybody off mute. Um, I just muted folks so that you we get a chance to um, ask questions. And it sounds like we do still have a little bit of background noises, but I unmuted everyone so that we can do a little bit of Q&A, and then we'll start talking about the collaborative campaign. So um, any questions that you might have, we'd like to hear them. All right, well, don't be shy to speak up. I've given you some fair warning, and then uh, we will um, definitely love to hear your questions here at the foundation as well. Um, but please speak up here in the next few minutes if you have any more questions. Heidi, it's Tim. Oh, yeah, um, please go. Hi, Tim. Hi. Um, do you have an outlook for the user survey results? Will those be in line with the Barcelona Summit? Um, yes, we do. So we closed the user survey on Sunday. Um, we have the data um, and we're working on doing a little bit of data validation. And then we're going to our data scientists with about 10 key questions. So you saw the really big 60 page report that came out in Austin that was a full scale community survey of more than 1600 community members and about 400 different deployments. Um, for the Barcelona cycle, um, we really narrowed it down, narrowed down the number of questions and, and also the number of participants where we were specifically targeting folks with deployments. So we have a smaller group of folks that we um, spoke to and that we heard from, uh, but we will be updating those kind of key slides that everybody goes to that we see in almost every single OpenStack day um, around um, the number of deployments in production, for example, or the emerging technologies that people are most interested in. You can expect to have a short form report um, sometime around the Barcelona Summit that gives us an update on the user survey. Um, we have a foundation lounge, um, and I'll be giving a short update on the user survey there in kind of a little lightning talk in the foundation lounge. Um, and then we'll also be sharing that through super user, of course. Sounds great. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Tim.